In a conversation with Sam Cooke about his new song, A Change Is Gonna Come, Bobby Womack describes it as sounding like death. Sam Cooke agreed, stating, that's why I'm never going to perform it in public. On December 11, 1964, just two weeks before the song's release, legendary artist Sam Cooke was shot and killed. Hi everybody, welcome to my channel and my newest segment, Art and Crime. I'll be discussing true crime cases where I'll be painting a scene related to the case. Before we jump into today's case, I just wanted to give you some content warning. Uh, today we will be discussing racism, rape, segregation, prostitution, and police brutality. So if this is something that could potentially bother you, please don't hesitate to click out of this video at any point. And I'll just catch you at the next one. Your mental health is, of course, of the utmost importance. Um, today we are discussing the murder or homicide of Sam Cook. I say or because it was ruled an accidental homicide or defensible homicide. And it's been called into question ever since. So we're going to be discussing his history, uh, a very, very legendary and profound one, of course, um, as well as the killing, the shooting of him. Um, I'm going to go over his history first and how he got started. Uh, Sam Cook was the son of Reverend Charles Cook Sr., a Baptist minister and uh, and Annie Mae Cook, who was his mother. Sam Cook was born on January 22nd, 1931 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and raised in Chicago Heights in Chicago. His early career was defined by his embrace of gospel music, uh, joining the Soul Stirrers at the age of 15 and serving as the group's lead vocalist until 1957. This wasn't his first musical Endeavor, though, he started singing with groups from the very young age of six, uh, with his father being a reverend. Of course, his music was gospel, and that is where he was primary, primarily focused for a very long time. Sam electrified the congregation with smooth, lifting vocals, uh, thus establishing a devoted following who embraced tracks such as Near to Thee, Touch the Hem of His Garment, and Jesus gave me water, among others. As somebody who's not religious, I have no idea what these songs are. But if Sam Cooke is singing them, I would definitely be listening to them. In 1957, Sam recorded his first solo record, Lovable, under the pseudonym Dale Cook, in an effort to avoid jeopardizing his standing with the gospel community. So gospel music and soul music was not something that meshed at the time. Uh, it was just not something that was considered a good thing. It was almost looked down upon, especially by Sam Cooke's father, Rev the Reverend. He wasn't thrilled about him spreading his wings and going into a more secular type of music is which how they looked at it. They thought that gospel is where they should stay. But Sam Cooke really wanted to reach out and reach a broader audience, not necessarily walk away from gospel music or the church, but just reach a broader audience. And that meant singing some secular music. Um, and then it was clear that he wanted to go past what he was doing. He didn't want to stay with the soul stirrers as his rest of his life. He had much bigger dreams. Um, nevertheless, he, he did want to move on and he finally got the blessing of his father and began to transition to popular music. His You Send Me was his earliest secular single. It shot to the top of the pop of the R&B charts. It was the first of 29 top 40 hits for Sam and solidified his place as a commercial artist and innovative pop stylist. By 1958, Sam was in high demand due to his newfound solo success. He signed with the William Morris Agency, appeared on numerous television programs, including the Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan, why can't I say that? Ed Sullivan Show. That same year, he performed for the first time in New York City's world-famous Copacabana. 
I don't know why, but that reminds me of I Love Lucy. Is that what the name of the club in I Love Lucy was? I think it was. Wasn't it the Copacabana? I wonder if it was the same. It can't be the same one. Was it the same one? I don't know. No, because Ricky owned that. Oh my God, I am completely <laughs> gone off track here. Uh, <laughs> probably not the same one. A nightclub previously off limits to rhythm and blues singers. While admittedly unprepared for his first appearance at the nightclub, he had initiated the process of opening doors previously closed to black entertainers. This is not the first time he would do that and it wouldn't be the last. In 1960, he signed with RCA where he wrote and performed hit after hit, including Chain Gang, Bring It On Home To Me, Cupid, Another Saturday Night, and Twisting The Night Away. Uh, versatile in his music styling sam tackled everything from ballads and pop to rock and roll and rhythm and blues he forged a distinctive link between soul and pop music this was his big goal with his music career was to really just put a bridge between these different first he did from gospel of course to more of the secular music and he just wanted to keep on going and and bridge the gap between pop and rock and roll and rhythm and blues um, Sam was also a really savvy businessman. He quickly established himself as a successful entrepreneur. This isn't something that was very common. I don't think it's really can be considered a common even today. I mean, you can be an artist and you can be a successful business person, but it's not common to be both. And especially back then, still not today. And I think that just kind of shows that he had the aptitude, uh, of somebody who was, this is probably going to, I don't know, is this lame to compare it? But I just think of like Jay-Z right now and he's, I mean, worth what? Is he worth, did he reach billionaire status? I don't know. I want to say he did with his alcohol, but, um, you know, it's just, it says a lot about somebody that can be such a genius in music and then also such a profound business person, especially as a black entrepreneur back then i mean this is something that is still a struggle today so can you imagine back in the 50s and 60s um but he did establish himself as a successful entrepreneur he changed the mainstream he mainstream music industry with the founding of a publishing company called cax music the launch of his own record label called sar records he transitioned from gospel to pop including Bo bobby womack johnny taylor billy preston lou rawls as a black artist at the time, he was a pioneer and true inspirational force in his community and throughout the music industry. Uh, 1960, by 1964, Sam was at the top of his game. He was eager to be embraced as a crossover or cross or why can I not speak today? My goodness. Crossover artist. He returned to the Copacabana for a week long residency and rehearsed confident the performance was a huge success. I'm, I'm kind of going over this quickly, um, just giving a basic, but there's a lot more to this. I mean, there's obviously, you don't just go like, wham, 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 all this success one after the other. He had some major struggles with it, and the Copacabana was one of them. And the first time he performed there, it was a flop. Um, it was a complete flop, and it almost... Uh, I, I don't want to say derailed him, but it did derail him mentally. He just struggled with how badly he did. And a lot of that was because he didn't stay true to himself. He realized that. Um, and he realized that with the help of, of, you know, having a producer who said, listen, you can't go back and try to redo who you are because that's not what got you to where you are today. You've got to stay true to yourself perform the music you know, perform it as you know it, and that's what people will love, and, and they were right, and that's exactly what happened the second time he performed at the Copa Gabbana. Uh, it was a huge, massive success, and the recording Sam Cooke at the Copa went straight to the top of the Billboard Hot R&B chart, so it was redemption for him. It was a way for him to kind of find peace with that part of his chapter because he did, like I said, struggle with how badly he did the first time he performed there. It was something that he kind of became a little obsessed with. Um, and it, it paid off in the end, but Sam wasn't just always about the music. Sam's refusal to perform for segregated 
audiences led to what many have described as one of the first real efforts in civil disobedience helped to usher in the brewing civil rights movement. That's massive. And it's, for me, um, and I'm going to say funny, but not funny, ha-ha funny. It's interesting because you don't necessarily hear that when you talk, hear about the civil rights movement being started. You don't hear about, at least I haven't heard of Sam Cooke really being that person. So when I was researching him, I found it incredibly fascinating because it was just seeing what he did and just seeing how he did it was so inspirational, so moving. And it was just like this man, this legend was a genius, a musical genius. I have no problem saying that because he absolutely was. And he was a successful black entrepreneur. And he was this person who helped start, helped move the civil rights movement. And I think that's incredibly major, which makes the story even more tragic and sad to me. Um, him refusing to perform for segregated audiences, I just can't even imagine what kind of, I don't want to say pressure, but uh, it seems like a no brainer. I think we can look back, you know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty, but if you look back, I mean, you've got to imagine this is something that at the time, not only could you be afraid this could ruin your career, but it could be potentially dangerous. It could cost you your life. It could cost your loved ones their life. And I think, a lot of people probably struggle with that uh, when they want to stand up to something. It's one thing to take your own risks for yourself, but to potentially put the people you love and care about in, in harm's way over something like that. It, it says a lot. Uh, and I think that it shows his character incredibly. And he was a visionary artist. He forged a link between soul and pop. He had a diverse repertoire and a platform unlike anybody else. And, you know, and, and unfortunately he met his demise at a very young age of 33. And as somebody who's over a decade older than he was when he was killed, I'm just like, what a way to feel like, oh, I haven't really done much in my life. By the time this man was 33 years old, look at what he had accomplished and it was just absolutely absolutely incredible what he accomplished by the time he was 33 and i can't even imagine what he would have done had he lived longer and it almost seems like a lot of these profound artists don't get that opportunity i don't know if it's because i don't know it's maybe a little too philosophical but it's almost as if one life can't contain that much that your life is going to be taken that young because you've just done so much. And it's just, I don't know, obviously philosophical, but it makes me think you think about some of these artists who didn't live a long life and you just wonder like what would have done, not just artists, but just some of these people in general. Um, it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely mind boggling to see what he has done, what he had accomplished in such a, a short life. Uh, and, and a change is going to come. The song itself, it's, I could almost do a whole video just on the song, that one song, because there is a lot to it. When, like I said, in the opening, uh, Bobby Womack, when he was listening to that song, he said, it sounds like death. And Sam Cooke responded, man, that's kind of how it sounds to me. That's why I'm never going to perform it in public. And just two weeks before this song's release, he was shot and killed. And it was, you know, it was almost his own foreshadowing. Uh, it was less than any song, less work than any song he'd ever written was um, in the book. Peter Girl, I can't pronounce his last name, Girlnick. Uh, author of the of Dream Boogie, The Triumph of Sam Cooke. He's a biographer. He's written about other artists as well. 
um, he goes on to say it almost scared him that the song, it was almost as if the song were intended for somebody else. He grabbed it out of the air and it came to him whole, despite the fact that in many ways, it's probably the most complex song that he ever wrote. It was both singular in the sense that you started out, I was born by the river, but it also told the story both of a generation and of a people. A change is going to come became the anthem of the civil rights movement. Sam Cooke was always pr protesting in his own way. Um, when he would perform, if the concert was segregated, he would turn to the black side of the audience and sing to them, ignoring the white audience. I can't even imagine what kind of disruption that caused. I love it. Um, in 1958, the March of Dimes hired Cook for a fundraising campaign and his success continued in the fifties. He experienced it hit after hit. Like I said, you know, with the, with the, you know, Copacabana and, um, you know, even though he struggled with that, it, even though it was disorganized and he didn't represent who he was, um, he used that as his fuel to keep going, to get him back going again. Um, and the and intertwined in that, like I said, you know, singing to the black audience and turning away from the white audience. It wasn't even just that. It's just every every step of the way he took, it was doing the right thing. One time, uh, when their car was broke down, the police told Sam to push the car to the side of the street, and Cook got out of the car and told the officer, "My name is Sam Cook. If you haven't heard of me." Your wife heard of me. When you get home tonight, ask your wife if she knows Sam Cook. I'm a singer. I'm not a pusher. I'm not pushing this car. He got back in the car and the police surprisingly <laughs> left him alone. I, I, that's crazy ballsy. It is not something I would even do. I just, I, I'm, I don't know how they let him go, but I'm pretty sure if, um, uh, if that happened today, <laughs> he'd still get in trouble for that. But that's that's pretty ballsy, pretty arrogant. But I don't know. You're Sam Cook. Maybe, you know, they <laughs> can get away with that. Um, but, you know, he did have in his short life, he did get hit with tragedy after tragedy. Uh, his 18-month-old son drowned in their pool. 18-month-old uh, son drowned in their pool. And when this happened... He was completely overcome by darkness. He wanted to die. And who can blame him? I can tell you that if something ever happened to one of my kids, I don't think I could breathe. I mean, the thought of it, my, my daughter is 16 months old. So just two months younger than his son. It makes me physically ill to think about. And I cannot imagine how you you can move on from that. But people do. And he did. And he, but he struggled with it. And what he did was not surprisingly just dive into his music and use that to be his therapy, um, which I completely get. And it was around this time that he met Alan Klein. Um, Alan Klein is another one we could probably do a whole separate video on. Uh, he's, in my opinion, a slime bag. And I just visually get this mental picture of Sam Cooke in this really dark darkness surrounding him after the death of his son. And I just picture that this devil walks in with horns on his head and that devil is Alan Klein. I know it's really cheesy. I'm being really weird and philosophical tonight, which is very unlike me, but just visually kind of what I was picturing, like just almost like coming to steal his soul type of thing. Um, and, and he was a slime ball. Alan Klein negotiated his music from RCA, gained even more control over his music. Um, it, but you know, Klein's the one that booked him again at the Copacabana. He did good. And I think that's part of it. You know, when you have, when you have people in your life that aren't good, it's sometimes hard to see that because they do good things and you end up focusing on that. And I think we tend to want to see things in black and white 
we see somebody doing bad things we're like well they're not a bad person because they did such and such and such and it's a good thing right and we're like well they did this and it's good so they can't be bad people because they did good but that's not how it works i think that when we see things in black and white like that it can hurt us and i think that's what happened to sam cook um and in fact alan klein is a person that a lot of people think was the cause of his death directly they think that he set up the killing of sam cook um i don't necessarily agree with that but we'll go over that and i will let you decide i will give you my opinion at the end but i'm absolutely curious what you guys think um and he just was one of these negative influences on him with his business and i think we've seen that a lot with for some reason i think a lot more with musical artists than we do with any other industry we just see these producers and managers just taking advantage of these artists um i'm not really sure why it happens more to musicians it feels like it does i don't know if it really does but def definitely feels like it does and but even despite that, he, of course, continued to grow. And one by one, every single one of his dreams was coming true. He was truly at the peak of his career. He was riding cloud nine. Uh, he also was friends. He joined forces with Cassius Clay. Uh, they both got involved in the civil rights movement. It became more about performing music. It became about something that needed to be said. Um, and, and that's when he wrote the song, a change is going to come. And I think that's a big part of why it did become part of the civil rights movement. Um, it was a huge thing for him. Sam cooks, what Sam cook was not only what people call the inventor of soul, but he was also the person who kind of began this civil rights movement. He was an entrepreneur. He was at the peak. He, influence and helped people like aretha franklin and rod stewart all the people who i i don't know why i said rod stewart and aretha franklin all these people who rose and helped this musical journey begin it was because of sam cook and i think that it's incredible that at the peak of this is when he was killed um the man his music are timeless but his life was anything but and it was a cool evening in South Central Los Angeles, in California. Sam Cooke was shot with a single bullet that pierced his heart. And it would go down on record as a killing in self-defense. And I don't know, as much as I researched it, I don't know if that's true. But um, the events of the evening were easily traced December 11th. He was at dinner with his wife, Barbara, his friend and producer, Al Schmidt and Schmidt's wife. Um, they were sitting at the cool red leather booth of Martoni's. Martoni's was a very popular restaurant in Los Angeles at the time where people like Sam cook would attend. Uh, Guy Bolleri was singing and playing on the piano in the background the four of them were drinking martinis, eating dinner, familiar faces are in this restaurant. I mean, just, can you, I can just picture it. Like, you just see, like, can you imagine Sam Cooke at this table with his wife, and you have this, and you have Guy Bellary singing in the background, and it's just, that would be his last last night on earth. Um, at one point, Schmidt says he sees Cook flirting with a woman with dark, almond-shaped dewy eyes and long black hair while his wife seemingly chats with friends oblivious this is how it's described but i really don't think she was oblivious because i think this was just kind of something she accepted and you know he just flirted cook tells al to meet him at a new nightclub on sun on sunset called pj's after he dra drops his wife off at home and so he does he agrees to meet him there but by the time that cook shows up at the nightclub it's already closing he arrives with this woman the same woman that he was flirting with earlier that evening but when they can't get in they leave uh the woman alisa boyer alisa boyer uh would be his demise just a little over an hour later 
He takes her to a seedy motel 15 miles away, and they check in at the Hacienda at about 2.35 a.m. He signs them in as his help, as himself and his wife, Barbara. Obviously not Barbara. She's at home with her children. When they get into the room, he drags her to the bed where he pins down and starts to tear off her clothes. He then disrobes, heads into the bathroom. Panicked, Alyssa Boyer grabs her clothes and runs out to the phone booth where she calls the police to tell them she was kidnapped. At this point, she realizes she accidentally grabbed Cook's clothes as well as his wallet containing $5,000. $5,000, just so you know, is worth at the time of this recording, just under $50,000. So he, he's just walking around with $5,000 in his wallet. Imagine walking around with $50,000 in your wallet. Um, not very smart, especially if you're in South Central Los Angeles. But um, at least that's her version of the story. That's what she tells. And we never know Sam's side of the story because he was killed that night. So we have nothing to go on but her side of the story and what little evidence was preserved, if any. Um, and, and so Sam never lived long enough to tell his side of the story. By the time the police get to him, he was already gone. Uh, so Cook comes out of the bathroom, realizes that his things, especially his wallet with a lot of money, are missing. He's drunk. He's angry. He's naked. He wraps himself in his sport coat, the only article of clothing left, and storms off looking for Alyssa Boyer. He reaches the manager's office and begins pounding on the door furiously. He breaks in, and in his drunken state, he grabs the manager, Bertha, 55 years old, aggressively as she drops the phone to the floor. And no matter what she does, she can't break free. No matter how hard she fights him, he won't let go. She re reaches and manages to grab her 22 and fires a shot and misses. She fires again. And yet again, misses. She fires a third time and the bullet goes right through Cook's heart and lung. He looks at her, stunned, and gasps his final words. Lady, you shot me. Immediately, Cook's friends cried foul play. But the motel's owner, Evelyn Carr, says she was on the phone with Bertha when the shooting happened. She stated she heard Cook come in. A conflict followed. And then there was a gunshot. Then Carr called the police. They believe, this is what his friends say, they believe that his death was a result of setup, claiming that Alyssa Boyer was a prostitute working in cahoots with the motel manager to rob Cook. <clears throat> the Hacienda Motel was a well-known hub for pimps and sex workers. Boyer, according to the theory, lured him there. Uh, why else would Cook travel so far out of his way, passing plenty of other accommodations more befitting his superstar stature, uh, which is true. While there's no direct evidence to support the story, Franklin was a former madam with a prior criminal record. Uh, Boyer was arrested on prostitution charges shortly after Cook's death. And in 1979, long after this, he, uh, she was found guilty of second degree murder following another shooting. The $5,000 that Cook was carrying the night of his death was never seen again, was never recovered. The bullet that passed through his body was taken into police evidence and then quickly went missing. His autopsy revealed a two inch bump on his head. Uh, Franklin claimed that after she shot him, she dropped the gun and beat him with a wooden broom handle Yet the gun still contained numerous bullets. If Franklin was frightened for her life, why would she drop the loaded gun she had just fired in favor of a broomstick? The woman appeared to have no marks or injuries when she testified before cameras five days after the murder occurred, which didn't make sense given the fight she described. Guests at the motel told police that they never heard any gunshots or sounds of an altercation. Police stated the area frequently had sounds of gunshots and used this as a reason for them to not to have heard anything. But I can tell you as someone who grew up in a not so great area of Los Angeles as well, uh, regarding how often I heard gunshots, which was a lot. I heard gunshots a lot. 
I didn't grow deaf to it. You don't grow deaf to it. If anything, each one became more and more nerve wracking because you just waited. You were like, this one's the one that's going to go through my wall. Um, so I don't buy that. You just don't grow numb to things like that. I don't know anybody who does. Crime scene photos appear to show abrasions on Cook's body. Singer Etta James, who viewed Cook's body at his funeral, wrote in her memoir that Cook's head was practically disconnected from his shoulders. That's how badly he'd been beaten. His hands were broken and crushed. They tried to cover it up with makeup, but I could see massive bruises on his head. No woman with a broomstick could have inflicted that kind of beating against a strong, full-grown young man. Uh, some people, as I mentioned, blamed his business manager, Alan Klein, who was a no notoriously ruthless music industry shark. He's slimy. I said it. I 100% I stand behind it. Um, they claimed that he wanted to wrest control of Cook's millions, and he did. He successfully did. Uh, much of the confusion surrounding Cook's death stems from the fact that the LAPD conducted only a cursory investigation, giving many the impression that authorities wanted to sweep the matter under the rug. If Cook had been Frank Sinatra, the Beatles, or Ricky Nelson, the FBI would be investigating, uh, which is what Muhammad Ali said. And I 100% agree with him. The L.A. Police Department was notoriously infamous for being racist even half a decade later. J. Edgar Hoover's paranoia and the FBI didn't help matters. Uh, when the police department showed up at the Hacienda, they practically shrugged at the scene, barely even acknowledging the murder scene. Uh, as far as J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, I mean, that's a whole... I know I keep having like these other, like, this is a whole other video. This one really is, could be probably even a whole series on this. If you guys are interested, it's one I really want to dive into. I really want to dive into Hoover and the FBI and kind of their history. Um, I think it also ties in, you know, I kind of want to do a whole Waco thing. So if this is something that interests you, let me know. I know a lot of people tend to like these one-off cases and talk about that. But if you really like the... I don't want to say police conspiracy because it's not. I mean, it's it's well known. But if, if you like that kind of stuff, like the history of it, uh, let me know. I, I, I'm, I'd like to do a video, but I don't want to do a video if you're not interested in it. Uh, so, but yeah, it's, it's not really surprising that people think this about the LAPD. Like I said, I, I grew up in LA. Um, I grew up there. I left, when did I leave? 2005, I think. So I was there. I was there during the whole Rodney King thing and the riots. And I can tell you that although this is, ha this happened decades before that, <laughs> not much changed with the LAPD. I'm not sorry to say that, um, because it's true. And I, I don't know, I haven't been to LA in almost 20 years or haven't lived in LA in almost 20 years. So I don't know if that's still the case, but it seems to be from what I'm hearing. Um, although not much has come out since his death, that refutes the self-defense reason for the homicide, we'll never really know because the LAPD's investigation really couldn't be called much of an investigation. The fact that an FBI conspiracy is in the realm of consideration is a testament to the deep racial divisions of the time, which I believe is still continuing to this day. The neighborhood where Cook was murdered would go up in flames the following summer during the Watts riots. The civil rights movement would endure, spurred on in part by song released, um, the song released, the change is going to come. And I can say that, you know, they, they say, well, there's not evidence really that disputes that, but just because we don't have evidence doesn't mean there isn't evidence, especially if you walk in to a room and you're not really acknowledging the scene of a man who's clearly been shot and killed, then I'm going to say that they probably didn't really look much. And I completely agree with Muhammad Ali. Don't think I say that too often. Um, I don't even know what statements he's made to say that, but I do agree with him. I think that if he were the Beatles, if it were John Lennon, I guarantee you that the investigation would have been much more intense than what it was, uh, which is sad to say. And of course, this is so long ago that we couldn't go back and find anything today. The bullet that shot him, that went through him, it's missing. I'm sure most of the evidence is also gone. 
And I don't think that we'll ever get a solid answer, sadly. Um, it's so tragic to me because obviously this isn't, there's so many cases like this, but it's just heartbreaking that even somebody of this profound stature back then couldn't get acknowledgement because of the color of his skin. Um, I 100% believe that's the reason why. And we'll never really know answers. Um, I think that the the trial was they used a lie detector, which the women passed. But we all know now that lie detectors aren't really, they're kind of awash. I, I don't take them seriously. But back then they absolutely did. And, you know, I've, I watched the documentaries. One of his friends said why he doesn't need to rape this, this woman. He's Sam cook. He doesn't need to, but we know better, right? We know better now. That's not why men rape women or why there is rape. It's about control. It's about, it has nothing to do with, you just want to have sex with somebody that doesn't want to have sex with you. That's not what the reason is behind it. So to say, oh, it's, why would he need to rape somebody? He, he can have whoever he wants. It's not about that. With that said, there are things that don't add up. What happened to his money? You know, the $5,000. So obviously, could he have tried to rape her and she saw an opportunity and afterwards, especially if she's a prostitute, because she have just saw the money and taken it and ran. Uh, she states that she accidentally grabbed his clothes that she didn't mean to. Uh, I don't know if I believe that part. Was he trying to rape her? Did he rape her? Was it, I don't know what, it, you know, this is not 2023. This is a different time. People had a different way of seeing things. He very well could have also felt, hey, I am Sam Cooke and I can have anyone I want is how he's thinking. And when he doesn't get what he wants, he does try something with her that very well could be. But we don't know. We'll never know because nobody did a proper investigation into his death. And we do know that his behavior with the police, not just on one occasion, we do believe I mean, we know that he was a defiant person, and in most cases, it was a good thing, you know, when it came to, you know, fighting segregation, when it came to the civil rights movement, but it also seemed to be just kind of his cocky attitude, too, you know, from his behavior with the way he said, I'm Sam Cooke, you may not know me, but your wife knows me, I mean, that's a super arrogant thing to say, it's probably true but still you don't really say that to people you definitely don't say that to a cop um and he says i'm not gonna push a car and you know for me it's like dude your car is broke down just push it to the side of the road like why are you too good for that and it seemed like that's how he kind of saw himself and of course this is all hearsay did that even happen it was reported by multiple people it seems to be a, a story that's widely believed but word for word is that what happened no it's kind of like the army tale like by the time the story gets to us who knows how exaggerated it is all of this is hearsay we have no idea unless it's on video even then we don't really know but it seems based off of his behavior and you know not wanting to sing to segregated audiences or if it is segregated he'd only sing to the black audience is defiant even though it's a beneficial defiant even though it's a good thing it is defiant and it does take a certain type of personality to do that um and could that personality type get you in trouble absolutely does it mean you shouldn't be that person no it's he didn't deserve to be shot and killed um i don't think he did and i know some people probably will disagree with me because if he did rape that woman and be like well you know what you know, he did deserve it is what they'll say. I don't believe that. With that said, if something like that were happening to me, I would absolutely do what I could to defend myself. Um, but remember that the woman who shot and killed him 
isn't the lady that he raped it was the manager at the hotel and she does say that he was very aggressive with her wouldn't let her go she felt threatened she was worried for her life but at the same time i do agree why are you going to hit him with a stick after you shot him if you shot him through his heart and his lungs with one bullet and he died shortly after um he wasn't putting up much of a fight after you shot him that's a pretty quick death and why would you hit him with a broomstick that's just weird you have a gun in your hand so i don't necessarily understand that part and I don't know if she just kind of had a moment of panic maybe after shooting him and and felt like she didn't want to overkill or she was like, I'm not going to shoot this guy again because he's down. But, hey, I'm kind of freaked out. We don't know how people react. We don't know how we're going to react in a situation like that. And people do kind of react in crazy ways when they're put into weird situations. There's enough video evidence of this today for us to know that we can turn around and say, you're kind of acting a little cuckoo right now. What is going on? Um, so who knows? Maybe she did hit him with a broomstick. I find it unlikely. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Uh, I don't know. But the whole thing with his manager, that he was involved with it, I don't know if I really believe that. I mean, I don't really see too much evidence. I haven't really been able to find any evidence to that. Was he a shitty person? Yes. Was he slimy? Yes. Does that make you a murderer? No. Does that mean you could be a murderer? Yeah. But he didn't really need to. And he doesn't... It's... You know, I think one of the things that we forget is... Somebody who commits a type of crime like that usually is going to have some sort of history or repeat of that after of that similar type of crime. Like people don't just randomly change their MO and go a completely different direction. Was he a slimy crook? Yes. And took advantage of people? Yes. But you don't typically go from one thing to the other. It's possible. I just don't really see that being the case. I think a lot of this is there's this really tragic, abrupt ending to somebody who was such a legend, who had just reached the peak of his career and who knows, could have done, probably would have done so much more for the civil rights movement, for music, for black entrepreneurs, for business, for the music industry. And it just... His life so tragically ended in such a senseless death out of nowhere. And I think a lot of that is people just trying to grasp some sort of justification in their minds. Like, no, it was this. Because that makes more sense than Sam Cooke was just senselessly killed because of an argument in a sleazy motel. Um, and it's just so sad to me. Uh and what's sad too for me is also it's unrelated to his death but after his death um things got weird too it wasn't the end of it wasn't the end of the craziness there was within the within the case itself bertha franklin said she received numerous death threats after shooting cook um, and then she left her position at the Hacienda Motel, did not publicly disclose where she had moved. And then after being cleared by the jury, she sued Cook's estate, citing physical injuries and mental anguish suffered as a result of Cook's attack. You killed him. You shot and killed him. And you're saying you suffered physical injuries and mental anguish. And so you're going to sue his estate. You killed him. His estate is going to his children. I mean, the man is dead. I feel like that. I don't know. I just find that super slimy and disgusting. I just think that you killed the guy. I mean, come on. Is that not enough? 
do you not agree? I'm curious what you guys think. Cause I just think that was so disgusting and slimy. And she was asking for $200,000 in compensatory and punitive damages, $200,000 back then. I don't even know. I didn't even do the math. So it's $5,000 is equal to like $50,000. Okay, so $200,000 would be like $2 million, right? Something like that. Uh, ba Barbara Womack countersued Franklin on behalf of the estate seeking $7,000 in damages to cover Cook's funeral expenses. I don't really get that connection either, but that's what she did. Uh, Alyssa Boyer provided testimony in support of Franklin in the case. And in 1967, a jury ruled in favor of Franklin on both counts, awarding her $30,000 in damages. Wow. I mean, I just, it's like pouring salt on a wound, right? I just don't get that. That I just don't get it. Like, you killed the guy. Like, just let it go. Just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and it's just, it's so tragic to me. Um, but the funeral services were held. Um, the first funeral service for Cook was held December 18th, 1964 in Chicago, 200,000 fans lined up for more than four city blocks in, where did I write this down? I wrote the temperature down because it's so crazy to me. Uh, minus 15 degree weather, <laughs> minus 15 degree weather in Chicago. Uh, 200,000 fans lined up for more than four city blocks in negative temperatures to pay their respects for Sam Cook. Uh, the next day, his body was flown back to Los Angeles for a second service at Mount Sinai Baptist Church on December 19th, which included a performance of The Angels Keep Watching Over Me by Ray Charles, who stood in for grief-stricken Bessie Griffin. And then Cook was interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Glendale, California. I have family members that are also buried there. Like I said, I'm from Los Angeles. These are my stomping grounds. Uh, so two singles and an album were released in a month after his death. One of the singles, Shake, reached the top 10 of both the pop and R&B charts, the B-side. A Change is Going to Come is considered a classic protest song from the civil rights movement. It was a top 40 hit and a top 10 R&B hit. Uh, the album also titled Shake reached number one spot for R&B albums. Um, he, the posthumous honors he received, there's so many of them. 1986, Cook was inducted as a charter member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 1987, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. In 1989, he was inducted a second time into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when Soul Stirrers were also inducted. February 1st, 1994, Cook received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, although he had never won a Grammy Award, he received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999. In 2004, he was ranked 16th on Rolling Stone's list of 100 greatest artists of all time. Uh, and then he was also named fourth greatest singer of all time by Rolling Stones in 2008. In 2008, he also received the first plaque on the Clarksdale Walk of Fame located at the new Roxy Theater. I used to party at the old Roxy Theater. It's kind of cool, right? Um, and he's also been... I mean, it just, the list goes on. Even until to this year, he had received another accolade earlier this year. It's 2023 currently uh, for in, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, the, I mean, it gets kind of dramatic too. Like there's definitely some drama um, when his his first wife so cook was married twice his first wife was killed in a car accident um like i said so he had that his 18 month old son was drowned in he drowned in the swimming pool um and then less than three months after sam cook died his widow barbara the second wife married his friend bobby womack and then <laughs> Barbara and Bobby divorced after Barbara discovered he was having an affair with Sam Cook's 17-year-old daughter, Linda. Disgusting. Linda married Womack's brother, Cecil Womack, and they became the duo Womack and Womack. I can't make this stuff up. Do I need to say that one again? 
Barry, Barbara, Co- I'm going to say this again. It's just, it's so convoluted. Barbara married, uh, Barbara, who is Sam Cooke's second wife, married Sam Cooke's friend, Bobby Womack. They divorced because Barbara found that Bobby, Sam Cooke's best friend, was sleeping around with Sam Cooke's 17-year-old daughter. And then his daughter then married Bobby Womack's brother. <laughs> and they became the a duo, Womack and Womack. No shame. Uh, Cook also fathered at least three other children out of wedlock. Uh, 1958, a woman in Philadelphia, Connie Bowling, claimed Cook was a father of her son. Cook paid her an estimated $5,000 settlement out of court. Uh, and then in 1958, Cook was also involved in a car accident en route, en route from St. Louis to Greenville. His chauffeur, Edward Cunningham, was killed, while Cook, guitarist Cliff White, and singer Lou Rawls were hospitalized. This also was a huge um, dark dark spot for Sam Cook as well. He was uh, definitely affected by the loss of his chauffeur. I mean, it's a chauffeur, but... Honestly, this guy was a very, very good friend of his. It wasn't just somebody who drove him around. It was part of their group. They traveled from place to place. So when this accident happened, this all kind of seemed to happen at the same time. His first wife was was killed in a car accident. And, you know, at the time, they were divorced. They weren't together. But they, she, he still had some respect for her. He still cared about her. He ended up paying for her funeral. Um, his 18-month-old 18 month old son drowned his really good friend was killed in a car accident that he was in the car with it was a lot it was a lot for him to go through all in a very very short life that he already had and it was a lot but if you are interested in watching anything on him um he was sam cook was portrayed by paul mooney in the buddy holly story it's a 1978 biographical biographical film so it's a little bit older but more recently um a film adaptation of one night in miami he's played by leslie odom jr um so this was there's two versions there's one from 2013 and then there's one in 2020 there's a couple documentaries um, one has his name in it, Sam Cook story, and then the other one is Lady You Shot Me. Um, both are very interesting. I got they're both approached very differently, and both have different information. So you can easily watch both documentaries and get something from it. Of course, biographies. There's plenty of books on him, but his music, I think, is obviously the most profound. A change is going to come is one of, if not, it is absolutely one of my favorite songs, all time favorite songs. It is just such a beautiful song. It is, um, it's just the way it starts with the music in the background and his voice. It's a haunting song, especially when you know the history. And if you didn't know the history of it, Hopefully this kind of brings a different light to that song. It's so profound in so many different ways. So I'm curious what you think. Do you think that he was murdered? Do you think that it was a planned murder by his manager? Do you think that it was just a defense, self-defense, like it was claimed? Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Please share with me what you think. Let me know if you would like me to do more videos on, unfortunately, there's quite a few celebrity murders and deaths out there, or if you want me to do the FBI one, um, either way, I would be open to it. If you have any case suggestions, please let me know as well. And I'm still working out all the kinks in this whole channel thing it's a lot to do just so you guys know it's i painted this painting over a month ago it has taken me so long to edit it i cannot wait until i get to the point where i can hire somebody to just edit these videos for me because once i get to that point i can definitely put put these videos out a lot quicker but it is a lot it is not just editing the audit audio part the talking part it's the artwork so i'm coming up with the artwork and also trying to figure out and so I have to record that and then I'm editing that part of it and then I'm also doing the research for the
the case. And I always feel like I'm not doing it justice because I feel like I can probably spend hours talking about each case and really going into depth and going down these rabbit holes of all the different side stories that can happen. Um, so I'm trying to work out the kinks. I appreciate you guys being patient about it. If you have any suggestions, I'm, I'm all ears. If you like the style, if you like maybe doing a deep dive series instead, that would probably be more my style because I do like to do a deep dive. Also, I'm a little delirious because our HVAC is out and I am sitting in a very warm room right now. I live in Phoenix, so you can imagine not having a working HVAC right now is awful. Um, fortunately, only one half of the house is not working. So the other half is cool, but the other half is not where I can sit because it's close to my kids' rooms who are sleeping. Anyways, I am babbling to talk about my artwork really quick before we close out. Uh, obviously, this is Sam Cooke at the piano. Uh, the song, A Change Is Gonna Come. And I don't typically do um, artwork that is, I don't even know what we can call this. Uh, what is this? I don't know what this is called. It's watercolor, of course, but I'm, I'm, I couldn't just paint a picture of him. There was, it's just so much going on, especially with this song. I kind of wanted to bring in the darkness and the lightness and it's all coming from his head. And I wanted to, um, put a lot of color into this painting, um, because that's just how his music is. And there's just so much depth and, and when they said that he pulled this music from air, I kind of wanted to represent that as well. And I kind of can relate as an artist to always have a lot going on in your head, always wanting a lot to come out of your head. You just can't keep up with the creativity side of things. It's almost a madness. So I get it. Um, but let me know what you think. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and hope you have a great evening.